All right. Well, here's a few news articles that may be of interest. <clears throat> I was surprised by this. A bunch of people are claiming to raise money for Donald Trump's campaigns or something to do with Trump, and they're just pocketing the money and they're not really working for Trump. So the fact that these scams exist, don't surprise me, they claim that a donor can stop Kamala Harris and socialism and so on, but they claim here that they can't do anything about it. And uh, that is very surprising to me. It would seem to me like you could be sued for some kind of uh, falsehood in fundraising here. Uh, but they claim that uh, this has been going on long. They can't do much to stop it from Trump's super PAC. The problem for us, the problem for the campaign, and the problem for the RNC, I... I don't know, if I put up a website and claim to be selling Coca-Cola and collect money and I'm not really Coca-Cola, they can sue me for trademark infringement or something. It's surprising to me that they feel like they can't do anything about it. Anyway, uh, so now that the uh, vaccine rollout is going really fast, very soon they're going to have everybody that wants the vaccine is going to get the vaccine, and you're going to have to deal with the people that don't want it, which is a really large amount of America. Apparently, half the Republicans don't want the vaccine, and they're about half the country, so that would be enough right there to prevent us from reaching herd immunity, probably. And uh, so it's a big issue. Congress itself, 25% of Congress has refused to get the vaccine. And uh, so there you hit the same problem we've had all through the rollout here. Uh, people have privacy, people have individual rights in America, you can't make them do it. You can't even probably make them tell you if they have done it without invading their medical privacy. So our, uh, our civil liberties get in the way of efficiently dealing with a virus like this. If there's a large amount of misinformation out there, which there absolutely is now, and uh, you know, all the news media I hear is getting all upset about the fact that Trump has not advertised the fact very much that he got the vaccine, he was proud of making it, and he did get the vaccine, and he said at CPAC that he got the vaccine, but he's not appearing on a series of public service announcements or anything telling people to take it, if indeed that would matter. Um, the Dogecoin is way up again because uh, Elon Musk made a couple of tweets about it. Uh, this is the point of high-risk investments. A high-risk investment is something that goes up and down erratically a lot. So, of course, there are moments when you can buy it low and it will go high. But in general, you can't count on it much, although all cryptocurrency just keeps going up and up. I, I still maintain a skeptic because there's nothing holding it up, but uh, it does keep going up and up. And uh, I think it's probably, um, it's probably got something to do with the large amount of money floating around with no use. Someone says, how to learn and improve instant response writing and planning skills. Uh, well, I mean, I've got a course in instant response. You could look at that, but I just uh, there are some books from Mandiant. Um, that's I would probably start there. They, they talk about that. If you go to my old classes, last semester I taught a class in instant response, and uh, I would start with this book here, which is from Kevin Mandia. He's one of the authors. Um, I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, this this is the. Uh, the Bible of these things, uh, Mandiant pretty much invented the field of instant response, and they do have these books about it. So I would start with this stuff, and it does talk quite a bit about how to uh, structure the written communications in addition to other things. So that would be a good start. All right, anyway. All right, anyway, so uh, Dogecoin waves up and down depending on every little tweet that comes out from Elon Musk since there's no actual value or profits running it up. Yeah, sure. Feel free. So anyway, um, exchange servers have been attacked by four zero days, and uh, somebody tried to post a proof of concept code a few days ago on GitHub, and Microsoft took it down. But now someone has posted another one, so anybody can get it. But what um, people and the experts are saying here is that uh, they, the Chinese were very sloppy. The Chinese government sponsored hackers hacked tens of thousands of exchange servers, apparently. But in the past, they've had like military operations that are relatively careful, that don't just trash a lot of servers and leave them open. But now they're just leaving wide open PHP shells on a lot of servers, which are then being reused by other people to put ransomware on them. So apparently the Chinese are just sloppily dropping unauthenticated shells on machines, which anybody can find. 
So uh, if you're running Exchange, you're in big trouble and you need to patch your stuff right away or isolate it or just knock it off and use something like Office 365. But um, it is an interesting issue. Something has gone wrong with this Chinese military operation. It's not showing the restraint of typical military cyber operations. It just looks like a bunch of lunatics. Um, now, the latest blockchain thing is these non-fungible tokens. Somebody made a non-fungible token. I think this contains the little GIFs of all the other GIFs. So it's the non-fungible token that contains all the other non-fungible tokens. The non-fungible token is just a GIF or a JPEG, just an image. But so somebody signs it and claims it is now unique. It's now the original image, although that person doesn't have to prove anything. So a lot of them are not really the original author of the art. They just copy somebody else's art, put a digital signature on it, put it on a blockchain, and then say, okay, now it's a token. And it makes as much sense as, say, Bitcoin or Dogecoin. It's just a cryptographic object that can be assigned an owner, and it has whatever value the market will bear, and some of them are rising to millions. Um, as the misinformation passes through America, a large amount of people go to QAnon, a large amount of Christians go to QAnon. A large amount of uh, fundamentalist Christians and evangelical Christians are Trump supporters, and a lot of them believe QAnon, and pastors are leaving the church, uh, just like the few Republicans that voted for Trump's impeachment are pretty much being forced out of the party. Uh, they say if you, if you preach in a church and you want to say anything against QAnon, you pretty much have to quit and give up because it's spreading through the country so fast and the people there regard you as a traitor for not going along with it. It is uh, a disturbing thing. And so the United States, again, is exposed as being mostly offense and not much defense. As all our exchange servers get hacked and other things, there was also the big hack through the supply chain, of that remote administration tool, SolarWinds. So uh, this is exposing a fact that we probably would not rather have the whole world know, which is that our defenses are very bad. There are official government tools to monitor the networks, and they obviously don't work very well. And so now there's another big push uh, trying to figure out what we can do to improve our defenses. Um, this is a fundamental problem of the whole internet. It favors attack over defense. Uh, you can, that's why I, I changed our cybersecurity training program when I, when I started it up years ago to do that because that's the way DEF CON does it. First you learn to attack and you don't bother with defense until later because it's actually very easy to show somebody some scripts or vulnerabilities or metasploit or something and teach somebody how to attack and they can hack a vulnerable system. Defending is much, much more difficult, a much more frustrating and complex skill. FireEye is going to have monthly threat reading briefings, and these are public, and the first one is tomorrow, March 16. So I'm going to tune in and see. They come at, at, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, anyway, by the way, there are many, many things going on worth extra credit. I put them at the top of my web page. Uh, there was one just before this class where you could talk to former spies from the NSA. Then the FireEye monthly breath, breath threat briefing tomorrow. And uh, Another guest lecture tomorrow night, and then GrimCon all day on uh, Wednesday. So, so they're coming very thick. All these are worth extra credit in any of my classes, and I recommend tuning into some of them. You can learn some new things. And I think I'm going to not bother with the other news items and get on to the official stuff for this class. This is 127, and tonight is Heap Overflows. All right, so they're going to do heap overflows tonight, and next week we'll start exploiting Windows, although I may have to cancel it. Um, I'm getting my second uh, shot of Pfizer on this Monday, and what people tell me is you'll feel okay that night, but then you'll feel really sick the next day. So I don't know if, I'll, if it's going to hit me or not. So be warned, I won't know until shortly before class if I'm feeling sick. Um, so... Uh, just tune in, and I will put some kind of message here if I have to cancel class. But um, anyway, I'm fine tonight, and let's do the heap overflows. So let me bring them up. That's right. For some reason, this thing is not working. Um, let's go down here. All right. Get rid of this thing. Okay, 127, Chapter 5, I think is what we want. All right, this will do. There's always something. For some reason, everything I type on my keyboard is appearing on the other screen I can't see. 
thought it was the same day. Well, that's what um, other people tell me. You're okay the same day and the next day you feel sick. Nobody really knows. Other people, it does nothing. That's what Fauci said. Um, and, yep, anyway, that's for later. Let's see if I can get to my slides. All right, I made it to the slides one way or another. All right. Let's get rid of that. All right, so we'll start with this stuff. So, uh, the heap is just a memory segment used by your program, like the stack, like the text section, and so on. And the point of the heap is, uh, remember, the stack is used when a subroutine calls another subroutine to remember the local variables and the return address so it can pick up where it left off when it comes back. And we've already talked a lot about how to exploit systems by overflowing a string variable on the stack. The heap is used for other purposes. You just use the malloc function to allocate some space on the heap, and then you store data in it. And when you're done with it, you use free to free it up. So it's used as a temporary scratch pad for any kind of temporary storage while a program runs. So if you overload a program in the debugger, GDB, and do info proc map, you'll see there's a stack and there's a heap. And there are other sections there too, but those are the ones, here's other sections here. But uh, anyway, uh, that's the point. It's just another data section. It's not necessarily very big. This is probably the minimum size because my program is very small, but you can just find it. Now the heap is structured like this. You have a chunk of data and then you have some metadata in each chunk, which is a size of this chunk, size of the previous chunk, pointer to the next chunk, and pointer to previous chunk. And these pointers are the part that matter to us most. So I have data stored here, which might be something like a string or integers or anything. And then it has a pointer to the next chunk and the next chunk, so you can walk the heap. Height, walk point, next, 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 back, 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 and that's what Cisco routers do. If you define an array, does it also allocate memory on the heap? No, just malloc. If you just define an array, uh, like char a bracket 10, it'll put that on the stack. If you don't tell it where to put it, it will take it local and put it on the stack. If you put it at the start of your program, outside all the routines, that'll make it global, and it'll put it in a data section. If you want to put it on the heap, you have to allocate it with malloc. That's the only way it gets there. A very good question. And of course, um, if so a programmer would have to write their program to use the heap, but many people do. But the important thing for us is consider here the data is here that might include a string, and I might be able to override the string. And if I override the string, I could override this data here. And then when I delete that chunk, it will try to fix these pointers, but it will be using bad information. And that's how we're going to take over the box. So here, uh, let me just bring up my virtual machine and do some of this stuff live. Uh, all right, I just want a plain old Debian, which is here. Okay, and I'm going to connect with SSH. All right, and let's see if I've got the same address I've had before. Nope. All right. Oh, it might be the other one. It is. Good. So I can use it as if it was a headless cloud server, which is what I like anyway. All right, so um, let's go into 127 and uh, ED205, all right. And let's just take a look here. So, make this big, all right. If I nano, say, ED205.c, all right, so here's a program which I got from a captured flag contest someplace. So I've got a function called winner that's gonna print something. All you see here is X's. I've got a function called no winner. Here's main. And see, here's a data structure defined outside that area. So this is a, a uh, object called struct that defines, that could store some data, one called data and one called FP. And now down here, it uses malloc to reserve one of those, enough room for data and enough room for FP. So it makes one object on the heap, just one chunk, and it shows you where it's stored. Then it copies the command line argument into the name part and then it executes the pointer stored at FP. And up here, it sets the pointer to not, no winner. So this is a very contrived example where it stores a pointer on the heap and then uses it as the address of something to execute to make the heap work like the stack. So the heap has some data, and then after that it has an 
argument that's going to be used to control the instruction pointer. So in this contrived example, exploiting the heap is going to be as easy as exploiting the stack. So if I run that thing, ed205, it's going to tell me I need to include a string. So if I put aaa, it's going to just tell me the data is here and the pointer is there. So this is at 160 and that's at 1b0. So it's just further down the heap. All right. So that's the story here. And so let's take a look at the heap. Let's run it in GDB. And then I can do um, list. All right. And I can do list uh, 18 to 25, say. All right. Um, let's list 26 to 33. All right. So here we are. Um, here is where it does the string copy. And so I would like to examine the heap after that. So let's put a break at 33. All right. So now if I run it, I'm going to run AAAA. And so that takes it, it makes it this far. Now I can look at what's going on here. I do info proc map. OK, so the heap is here at this address. So I can examine the memory of that address by just copying that. And I can do x slash 130x. All right. And see here, I've, there's the 41, 41, 41, 41 on the heap someplace. And here's an address that looks pretty good, ending in F6. So if I quit from this, I can now disassemble. No winner. And I will see it's the same. 080484F6 is this address. So this is the area reserved to store my string. This is some kind of metadata. And this is the address going to be used by that pointer. So if I can overrun the heap by enough, I can overrun that pointer and take over control of the machine. So just to uh, finish this one, if it's not obvious, I can disassemble. No winner. And I want to hit this address. So I just need to find the right way to attack the heap. So I can go back to running it here. I can have I don't know if that's enough. Let's see. Run it again. Now examine the heap. And there's all those letters. That is not enough. I need to go even further. Uh, I made it down here. Here's all the letters A, B, C, D, and it didn't make it. So I need to make a longer attack. So let's go here. And let's just start with numbers now. See if that hits it. And whoops. What's going on here? Run that. Yes. OK. Now examine the heap. All right. It looks to me like I did hit it. And I'm pretty sure I hit it with the 35, 35, 35, 35. Because I think it was right at the bottom of the visible screen before. So if that's true, I can fix my attack. And I can put, in, instead of the fives, I can put one, two, three, four. Say yes. And now if I continue, it does put one, two, three, four in the stack. So now I know how to do the injection and take over the instruction pointer. I need that string right there. So I can just, um, I think I'm just going to make another connection here. I'm second window. I'm going to SSH um, uh, Debian at, just a moment, I have to get the IP address here. OK, 192.168. All right, and I've got it. Whoops, OK. All right. 
And so that's what I've got here. I can nano H4, really, is what I can do. The other ones are not really necessary. So the point is, all that junk there turns out to be 80 characters, and then the next four are there. And there's the address to execute, 080484CB. And I can see that if I disassemble winner. So that's the address ending in CB. And I put it here. So this should do it. If I run that, so I, this is H4. So I should be able to run and put in the uh, output of H4. And if I say yes, it's going to hit the breakpoint. And if I continue, it works. I get the, the winning message. So this is very much like the very first buffer overflow on the stack we did. We're just doing it on the heap. So uh, let's see what we have here. We talked about that. So you get a crash. We get a segmentation fault showing there's a problem. Then you can find where the code is and uh, overflow it and control it. So that is the simplest example. But that was a very special kind of program that actually stored a pointer on the heap and then used that heap to control execution explicitly. And normally that's not the case. The stack always contains a return pointer. So you got a nice target. The heap usually does not. But it does have addresses used for writes. And those are used, for example, when free is called. So if you consider this, if I have a series of nodes on the heap, and then I delete this node, now it needs to update this pointer here. So instead of pointing to this node that is gone, it points to this node up here. So what it will do is it will update a node here, a, a value here, with a value that came from this, which is the pointer to the next one. And it will update a value here, the return pointer, with data that came from there. So if you think about it, that means there are two write operations going on. One write to the forward pointer of the previous node, and one write to the reverse pointer of the next node. And those write operations use information from this node. And if I was able to overflow a string variable and affect the metadata of this node, I could affect those write pointers. And that's what's going to happen. So now you can control one write operation. And therefore, if you have a write operation, you gain to write someplace that's going to control the uh, instruction pointer. And so you could write somewhere on the stack, for example. You could write to global offset table, which is what we're going to do here. So you overwrite the address to one of the C library functions. You could hit the destructors table, you know, or other, other places you can hook into the libraries. The at exit structure that's called when your program stops. Um, and in Windows, you could attack the uh, exception handler, which is another place you can just write addresses, which will be used eventually when exceptions are triggered. So that's the point. And so I've got a few cahoots, and then I've got another uh, example to show you. So let's take a look at these cahoots. There's 127, Chapter 5. What is this nonsense? Well, all right, there it is. They seem to have changed the layout a little bit, but I'm able to find it. That's all that matters, I suppose. Not attempting SQL injection. Oh, well, it's not obvious. Oh, somebody here, but oh yes, oh you could be yes. I've had students try cross-site scripting too. It doesn't seem to be vulnerable. It certainly could be though. Uh, there was a student that ran a script to cheat at the cahoots, and that worked. It's really obvious though. What it does is make thousands of names and then automatically answer every answer as quickly as possible. So one of them gets them all right and you win, but it's, you know, it floods the whole screen with fake names. It's 
not subtle at all. <laughs> That's the only Kahoot exploit I came across. All right, I guess we're ready. Wait a minute, I see something. Oh, I see, that's just on my screen. Good, it's not in your way, that's all that matters. Okay. All right, so how do you reserve space on the stack? I think this student downloaded that exploit somewhere, but you could just write one in Python. It's pretty simple. But, I mean, you're never going to get away with cheating with it because it's incredibly obvious. <laughs> okay, that's it. This is how you do it. When you define a normal variable, it goes on the stack. All right, how do you find where the heap is? Yep, that's it. Info proc map is what does it. Shows you the memory map. All right, how about creating a new chunk on the heap? Yep, that's what malloc does. All right. All right, what moves EIP to an attacker controlled value when the stack overflows? Yes, when you return, it goes to the return pointer, which is stored on the stack. All right, what command becomes an arbitrary write after a heap overflow? Good, that's free. All right. All right, and which command allows direct control of the EIP after a heap overflow? That's it. None of them will do it. That's the thing. The heap does not give you direct control of the EIP. All right. So, all right, I don't know who that is. And uh, that looks like a real name. All right. All right. Well, we're, I'm going to stop this recording.